Our speaker tonight is Wayne Franklin, who just recently was appointed Director of American Studies and Professor of English at the University of Connecticut. Uh, prior to that, he was Davis Distinguished Professor of American Literature at Northeastern University. Dr. Franklin uh, did his undergra undergraduate work at Union College in Schenectady, New York, and his graduate work at the University of Pittsburgh. He is the author of several books, including Discoverers, Explorers, and Settlers, The New World of James Benamore Cooper, and A Rural Carpenter's World. He is also the editor or co-editor of several uh, volumes in American Literary and Cultural Studies, including the Norton Anthology of American Literature and Mapping American Culture. Currently, he's working on a multi-volume biography of James Fenimore Cooper, and the first volume of that biography will be published next year by the Yale University Press. That's in 2006. The title of Dr. Franklin's lecture tonight is War of Words, Fighting the Last Colonial War in American Literature. Would you please welcome Dr. Wayne Franklin. Good evening. Uh, my topic tonight uh, concerns how the Seven Years' War became a literary subject for American writers in general. It's been, I think, both a minor and a major theme. The Revolutionary War and eventually the Civil War have consumed far more paper than the conflict known here as the French and Indian War, surely because those two wars raised more fundamental national questions and involved larger portions of the contemporary population. On the other hand, the first and still most famous American historical romance, James Fenimore Cooper's The Last of the Mohicans, was set during the French and Indian War. Not only did that novel codify and perpetuate the American sense of outrage over the infamous massacre at Fort William Henry, it also established the patterns that would help shape most American historical novels, especially those concerned with Indian warfare and what eventually was called the West. Since first the dime novels in the 19th century, early paperbacks, and then Hollywood in the 20th incorporated those patterns, it hardly is an exaggeration to say that the French and Indian War as a literary topic has been more influential than any other conflict in the country's past. That's not to say, though, that it was a natural topic for James Fenimore Cooper when he began writing his novel in 1825 or when he finished and published it in 1826. In point of fact, the revolution came to him more immediately. And as I hope to show, it was only in the midst of researching his third Revolutionary War novel in Boston in 1824 that Cooper accidentally came across the means by which he would soon give the Seven Years' War its literary debut. The movement back in time from the Revolution to the Seven Years' War should not be taken to suggest that it was any easier for Cooper to write about the Revolution in the 1820s than the earlier war. Any historical subject was untried and therefore in the peculiar conditions afflicting the American publishing industry at the time, unlikely. The market conditions that faced Fenimore Cooper and his literary contemporaries were very uncertain. Most made very little money from their work, largely because book publishing was an unformed and undercapitalized business. One consequence of this state of affairs was that Cooper felt it necessary to self-publish most of his earliest books, a risky approach, but the only one that promised even the chance for earning sufficient return on his labors. Self-publishing also allowed him to experiment with untried themes and topics, however. When his first book fell flat, eating up the proceeds of a whaling voyage on which Cooper had sent a ship he owned, he at least did not have to struggle to convince a wary publisher to fund what surely would have seemed a second unpromising venture, the Revolutionary War novel called The Spy, that Cooper was, very, uh, was soon very busy writing. In authoring that second book, which in fact did very well indeed, Cooper was both lucky and shrewd. When he began his literary career as recently as 1820, Fiction writing was a small and particularly uncertain part of the American cultural landscape. 
and historical fiction was the newest of the few subtypes then known. This was not a great age for fiction on either side of the Atlantic, but in America, this, the situation was especially unpromising. Some figures may help paint that picture. From the first novels written and published by Americans in the 1750s and 1760s up to 1820, period of 70 years, barely 100 novels uh, had been produced by Americans. Production had been speeding up slightly across this period, though irregularly, since 1800 especially. But that still meant that only a few books appeared each year. The country was, of course, very small, even in 1820, when the total population was about 10 million. Yet, even in absolute terms, that was a, a, a really low point. It helps to put such figures into context by comparing them to current ones, for instance. At the start of the second millennium, as the national population approaches 300 million, American publishers are producing about 100 new novels every other day a rate several hundred times higher than that of the early period, Cooper's period, during which it took 70 years for the nation to reach the first hundred. After that point, after 1820, things accelerated a bit. It took only a second decade, from 1820 to 1829, to double that figure. During the 1830s, production tripled, a significant milestone, although it still would have been possible for an average reader uh, to read all American novels without really hurrying from book to book. Not until after the Civil War would the deluge start. Cooper's interesting in part because in the, the 1820s, he authors 10% of all American novels. Uh, and he invents a number of different uh, very useful kinds of American fiction. That's his intent, is really to make novels uh, about American life uh, a going affair. So we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about that. In addition to its modest size, the fiction business in 1820, when Cooper started, was marked by uh, cultural, social, and financial constraints that militated against serious engagement with American subjects of any kind, including the new nation's most recent historical and military struggles. The vast majority of American novelists who wrote prior to 1820 weren't really novelists in the modern professional sense of the term. Only two, for instance, published more than a single book or two, meaning that the typical early American novelist was a one-hit wonder, without, in most cases, the hit or the wonder. The usual early American novel was a short knockoff of European originals, perhaps based on real events, so-called, to which the author was privy. Uh, although many of them were set in America, at least nominally, that was about all it was, was nominally. There was, for instance, relatively little exploration of the new social conditions produced by new governmental forms. What did it mean to have a democratic culture and a democratic literature? Aside from a reference here or there, a reader at the time would hardly be able to give, based on the available novels alone, a coherent account of what most Americans sounded like, because they didn't speak American English, what they did on a daily basis, what they believed, or even who they were. Slavery barely was mentioned, even in passing, and history was mostly ignored. A reader at the time would learn very little about the Seven Years' War from novels, even about the Revolution, the struggle responsible for the very existence of a theoretically separate American publishing industry and a reading public in the first place. It's a telling fact that the runaway, indeed only bestseller in this early period, Susanna Rousen's Charlotte, A Tale of Truth, had been written by an English uh, woman, uh, <coughs> excuse me, by an English woman, and did not do especially well when first published in England in 1791. Only after Rousen, an actress by profession, emigrated to this country with a theatrical company in 1793 and then reissued the book here, the following year, did it find what would prove to be an astonishingly large audience, something like 200 editions in the next 100 years in the U.S. American readers probably took to Rousen's book in part because of the setting. It's a, about a trip from England to New York and events then unfold in New York. Uh, 
but mostly, I think, because its moralistic lessons about chastity were useful means of social control in the New Republic. That Rousen had lived in this country for some time as a girl, when her father served in Massachusetts as a Royal Navy officer, gave her some acquaintance with conditions here, but she deployed that knowledge in so light a manner that it hardly would have accounted for the success of her book had it been lacking that moral thrust. Rousen's avoidance of the revolution in Charlotte Temple reflected a, a broad disengagement from that topic and other historical topics in contemporary writing. If this was so with regard to the revolution, it was even more so with regard to the Seven Years' War. None of the hundred early novels took up in any serious way either of these conflicts. Much has been said about the failure particularly to treat the revolution. Literary scholar Henri Petter declared 30 years ago that it was left to Cooper, who came at the very end of this first period. He was born in the year Washington became president. And he started writing in 1820. It was left to him uh, 50 years after the fact to first capture what Petter called the spirit of the War of Independence in fiction. This was the first of a series of innovations that would give Cooper an especially formative imprint in the national literary landscape, and that would lead, as I hope to show, to his explorations of that last colonial war, too. Petter's point's proven by a brief review of Cooper's most important predecessors. Charles Brockton Brown, who wrote more novels in the early period than any other figure except Susanna Rousen, had been born early enough, 1771, to experience the revolution firsthand. Brown implicated the war in his works. It's always sort of around the discussion, uh, but he nonetheless never addressed it frontally. He wrote no uh, historical fiction of that sort, uh, engaging big social and military conflicts. Part of the reason probably sprang from the very novelty and nearness of the topic in Brown's time. Dramatist William Dunlap, a friend of Brown's and later of Cooper's, began a tragedy on the theme of Major Andre, the British spy, and his companion, Benedict Arnold, in the early 1790s, but uh, for eight years couldn't finish it because of concerns that the familiarity of the subject would put him at a double disadvantage. On the one hand, Dunlap feared that the audience would scorn his attempt to turn so recent an event into a work of fully tragic proportions, often a consideration with writers. Dunlap also worried, though, that the fresh memories most Americans of the time had of the underlying historical events would make them hypercritical of his performance. Each member of the audience might expect to see all that he or she remembered of the, of the events surrounding Andre portrayed in the play, and if Dunlap didn't so portray the, the, the event or the events, uh, they would hold him accountable. There were also, I think, important political considerations. Dunlap finally did finish the play and had it performed in 1798. When he did, the ordinary citizens in New York and the audience rioted because they felt that the dramatist and some of his so-called American characters on the stage were too respectful, indeed venerable, venerating in their uh, attitude toward the uh, damned spy Andre. Uh, Dunlap hastily recast the play. Uh, Eventually, he uh, uh, moved it off of Andre as the center and focused it instead on the three American militiamen, uh, heroes, all of them, who had arrested Andre and turned him over in 1780. Uh, And it was then thereafter called not Major Andre, but the glory of America, her yeomanry. In that form, the play became standard Fourth of July fair and was repeated almost to the middle of the 19th century around the country. In the case of Charles Brockton Brown, such considerations probably also had force. It's important to recognize, uh, for instance, how constrained individual authors at the time were by the very personal legacy of the war. For Brown, the experience of his father, one of uh, 18 Philadelphia Quakers arrested and sent into exile in Virginia in 1777, enormously complicated his feelings. As a result, the subject of the revolution lay beyond genuine exploration for Brown, certainly beyond the sort of naive celebration that Dunlap, for one, sought to produce in Andre. 
Susanna Rousen uh, showed a similar avoidance for arguably similar reasons. Having come to the colonies as a girl of about six in 1768, she was about nine years older than Brown, uh, she had lived through the first years of the revolution before returning to England. That experience certainly provided her with the same kinds of personal memories that Brown, though slightly younger, also had. Once Rousen came back to America as an adult in the 1790s, however, she, like Brown, mostly shunned the revolution as a literary subject, even though she quickly showed herself an avid supporter of the New Republic. And a couple of her brothers uh, came to America and became, one of them became a naval officer, the other was some sort of public official. They uh, embraced the New Republic uh, wholeheartedly. In her case, as in Brown's, though, parental shadows intervened. That her widowed father, that Royal Navy officer, had been assigned to the Revenue Service in Boston in the Stamp Act years helps explain her silence. So does the fact that due to Lieutenant Rousen's position, the family was stripped of its property and interned among other Bay State loyalists after the start of hostilities. Uh, Washington Irving, a New Yorker, the author who made the most intriguing use of the revolution in the pre-1820 uh, period in Rip Van Winkle, also the legend of Sleepy Hollow, was, I think, diagnostic in his attitudes, particularly in what he didn't do in those two famous stories. In Rip Van Winkle, he let his hoary-locked, henpecked hunter sleep through the conflict, if you recall, making the war literally an offstage event as well as a comically shallow one. Irving's anti-hero thus was a figure of forgetting rather than memory, perhaps the one American of the revolutionary generation who claimed to know nothing whatever of the nation's bloody origins, nowhere bloodier, of course, than in Rip's own Hudson Valley. By implication, Washington Irving may have been suggesting how much all the rest of the survivors might divulge if they wished, but he hardly helped them divulge it. Part of the reason was personal, part cultural. Rip's creator himself had been born precisely in Rip's position, belatedly in New York in 1783, named after the first president. And yet, for him, the revolution was a closed chapter, the nation an accomplished fact. So it was hard for Irving to think his way or imagine his way back. Um, but I think that there was something more uh, at issue, too, in Irving's case. He actually wrote Rip Van Winkle not in the Catskills or in New York City, but rather in the English Midlands. Uh, he was living in Britain, had been for several years. His family was in uh, an importing business. It was failing at the time he started working on these stories. Uh, and he took a break from London and went to Birmingham, where his sister, uh, Sarah and her husband, Henry Van Wart, who was a partner in the Irving family business, were living. And there, as the three New Yorkers kind of reminisced about their missing home place, uh, this story emerged for uh, Washington Irving, and, and he wrote it. He was in exile uh, in, at the time he wrote it, as he was when he wrote the Legend of Sleepy Hollow, which similarly evades the revolution. If you recall, it takes place, uh, the, the key event, when the pumpkin's thrown at uh, 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 Ichabod Crane, it takes place just at the bridge where Andre is said to have been captured. And yet it's not really uh, Andre's tragic story and the, the uh, threat to the republic that engages uh, Irving's attention, but rather kind of old stories of witchcraft and goblins and Halloween pranks. Um, so that there, too, this exile living in England in the late 18-teens, dreaming of New York, is unable somehow to cross the threshold and engage the story of actual American experience. The Seven Years' War uh, hardly involved the same sorts of political issues that I think kept some Americans from crossing that threshold. But I would argue that for Americans in the 1820s, it could become available as a literary subject only once the revolution had been confronted and somehow contained or made usable. Cooper's important because unlike Irving and the other preceding generation of writers, he really did in, uh, confront and engage the war. Uh, he also did that with regard to the last of the Mohicans. Though um, 
I'd like to just suggest that how he engages the Seven Years' War in The Last of the Mohicans is rather different from the way we may expect he did it. Those of you who are familiar with film versions of The Last of the Mohicans, especially the most recent one directed by Michael Mann in 1992, will probably expect to hear me say that Cooper saw the two wars as parts of the same story, the story of how the mainland British colonies came to sense their imminent maturity while fighting the French and their Indian allies in the 1750s and early 60s, and once that conflict was over, set about leveraging their way out of the now enlarged British Empire. There is in Mann's film a series of diagrammatic scenes that make this connection, but that have, interestingly, I think, no basis whatsoever in Cooper's novel, or indeed in Cooper's thinking about the American past. Cooper creates in the, in the novel an array of British and American characters from Colonel Monroe, Scotsman, and his two daughters, Cora and Alice, to the young American officer from the South, we're not told what's, what uh, colony he's from, uh, <clears throat> by the name of Duncan Hayward, uh, and uh, the hunter and scout, Natty Bumpo, and Bumpo's Mohican companions, Chingachgook and Uncas. All of these characters, despite their array of backgrounds, origins, social standings, uh, cultural differences and so forth, all of them are arrayed by Cooper on the same political side in the war, developing the first... Uh, <clears throat> Cooper develops the first segment of his plot, for instance, out of the efforts of Hayward and Bumpo and the Mohicans to reunite Cora and Alice Monroe with their father, who was the commander of Fort William Henry. Michael Mann, in keeping with uh, the popular American understanding of this war, as a trial run for the revolution, fractured this sense of cultural and political unity among Americans and Brits from the outset. In place of Cooper's somewhat inexperienced but right-thinking Southerner, he made Duncan Hayward into an arrogant British officer who from the very outset is outraged by what he sees as the heady self-assertion of the provincial American citizens and militia. Hayward comes into the film just as General Webb in command of British forces in New York is engaged in a debate, for instance, with colonists who feel that the Crown has no concern for their welfare as it sets about fighting its war against the French. Astonished to find Webb negotiating with men who are, in his view, subjects of the king and nothing more, Hayward complains bitterly of such coddling, accommodating methods. There's no such scene in the book, nor is there the slightest trace of the one that precedes it, in which British recruiters on the New York frontier address a mixed assembly of white settlers and Mohawk warriors, both of whom uh, are skeptical about the war and yet both of uh, whom are so friendly with each other that the scene closes with an energetic lacrosse match between them. In the course of the scene, Natty Bumpo defiantly counters the British recruiter's angry assertion, you call yourself a patriot and loyal subject of the crown, by saying with an American twang, I don't call myself subject to much at all. Here, as in his arrest later by Colonel Monroe for treason, only in the film, uh, <clears throat> Natty Bumpo is portrayed as the archetypal rebel, and the French and Indian War is thereby transformed into a proxy for the revolution. Mann's film is so insistent on this revision of the novel that it even puts Cora Monroe, a British, a young British woman, the daughter of the commander of Fort William Henry, into the position of correcting Hayward's snotty superiority. Cora goes so far as to take Natty's part while he's imprisoned, and at one point, even farther, suggesting that the Americans would be better off if the French won the French and Indian War rather than the British. These revisions by man are not accidental. I think they reflect a long-standing inability of the popular American imagination, particularly in the 20th and 21st centuries maybe, to deal with a number of key historical facts of colonial origin. By rewriting the colonial past, especially the late colonial past, 
as inevitably aimed toward the revolution, we've for long suppressed both the profound break with Britain that occurred then and the interdependent realities of political, economic, and cultural life in the pre-revolutionary colonial world and, I would add, long afterward. Uh, independence as a political fact um, precedes in, in really important ways independence as a, a cultural and psychological fact. And remember, too, that just before Cooper starts writing, uh, there's been a second war with Britain, which a lot of Americans call the second war of American independence, the War of 1812, as we sort of ineptly still call it. There were deeper, older tensions between Great Britain and the colonies, and the war between France and Britain was part of a global imperial struggle. But to, uh, uh, as Americans in popular media have done, conflate the French and Indian War with the Revolution and make the whole of the colonial past push toward the inevitability of separation from Britain is to simplify things and also, I think, to to downplay the way in which the revolution was an act of political will rather than an inevitable historical event. People decided to have a revolution. It didn't decide to have them. Uh, you can trace this habit of collapsing the two back as far, I think, as Benjamin Franklin. When Benjamin Franklin uh, started his memoirs, published later as his autobiography, in England in 1771, six years after the Stamp Act crisis, but at a time of some subsidence, particularly following the Boston Massacre the year before, in hostilities or feelings of hostility. He, uh, he was sitting in England and, and was um, inclined to emphasize the continuity in his family's experience with its English origins and connections. Once the revolution occurred, Franklin, who interrupted the writing to tend to other things in the meantime, picked up the story 13 years later, 1784, uh, and uh, in that new part of the manuscript dealt with the French and Indian War at, su at some length. He never finished the story. Now, um, as a member of a free and independent nation, not a kind of colonial, marginal colonial and uh, imperial official, uh, in England, uh, Benjamin Franklin wanted to see, very much to see, the French and Indian War as a justification for and a kind of providential first act of the revolution. Hence, he emphasized the disastrous expedition of General Edward Braddock, uh, to which he'd lent some tactical support in Pennsylvania, uh, as a kind of foretaste of British arrogance uh, both with regard to the difficulties of fighting an American war and with regard to the capabilities of colonials to fight the British imperial uh, uh, power. Uh, he, he writes, uh, in quoting Braddock, uh, uh, quote, these savages, Braddock says, may indeed be a formidable enemy to your raw American militia, but upon the king's regular and disciplined troops, sir, it is impossible they should make any impression. Um, this was some weeks before Braddock himself died as a result of probably what was a chance encounter in the woods of uh, western Pennsylvania uh, during which his regular disciplined troops were very irregular and very undisciplined. Uh, Benjamin Franklin uh, wanted to see this event uh, as... Uh, uh, lending to Americans as they thought about their situation vis-a-vis -vis Britain in the 1760s and 1770s, a kind of hunch that they might succeed. And I think that's the first record I see in uh, American writing that makes this kind of collapse between the two wars. There's very little doubt in my mind that that the story of Edward Braddock has had a long half-life. That's the ultimate source, I think, for Michael Mann's invented or interpolated scenes in his version of The Last of the Mohicans. Braddock's arrogance is Duncan Hayward's arrogance. Um, Duncan Hayward makes the same mistakes of assumption and presumption as Braddock in Franklin's autobiography. Why 
Fenimore Cooper himself didn't participate in the same collapse of differences is, I think, an intriguing question. The short answer is that he was uniquely situated to understand the differences between the two conflicts, uh, the one that Natty Bumpo calls the old French war and the revolution. He neither conflated nor confused the two. Cooper, uh, for a little bit of biographical background, was a sometime Navy officer and descendant of Quaker forebears for whom the military and political and cultural fortune fortunes of the new American nation in the 18-teens were a very serious issue. He was also a penniless heir of a, of a sometime rich frontier land developer who left his six adult children a promise of wealth, along with many debts and the distinct handicap of costly habits. By 1820, James Cooper's four older brothers all had died after having further mangled the family estate. He himself was married and a father of three daughters and having lived well in the false expectation of a large inheritance, he was seriously in debt. He'd been thrown out of Yale in 1805 for misbehavior. His brother William probably burned down Princeton a few years earlier. We're not exactly sure, but he, he also got thrown out and his father set him to learn the law as a kind of... Um, Kind of uh, a, a kind of uh, penalty um, for having misbehaved, but he never became, as one might expect, a very good lawyer. He never really practiced. He died young, uh, drunken, uh, misspending his money and everybody else's. Um, James had a slightly better outcome, perhaps he had because he had four brothers predecease him and giving giving him warnings about uh, cleaning up his act. However, in addition to uh, having been thrown out of college, he had joined the Navy and then hastily quit it at the insistence of his bride in 1811. He really wanted a war with Britain, and he quit the year before it happened. And, of course, it happened. Uh, it started as a Navy war. He was uh, serving under James Lawrence, who would go on to lose the Chesapeake off Boston in 1813 in a, a celebrated naval encounter, one of the first reversals of the Navy war against Britain in that, at that time. So Cooper was a frustrated naval officer. He later wrote a history of the Navy. In 1820, he had no profession or prospects. The nation had just gone through the panic of 1819 with business and bank failures and entered a very uncertain new decade. However, Cooper had picked up from his friends in New York City stories of a Scotsman, Sir Walter Scott, who had been making oodles of money publishing anonymous historical novels. And Cooper decided, though he, he was so unlikely a writer that he couldn't stand the feel of a pen in his hand. He had, however, read a lot of fiction. His, his mother read novels to him when he was a boy. It was the only thing he did seriously while he was at Yale or uh, in the other years of his youth was, was read. So Cooper decided um, that maybe he could make a name for himself, more importantly, make some money by writing novels. It's an absurd proposition, but it worked. The, his first book, to be called Precaution, when it was published in 1820, was no historical novel. He didn't start uh, immediately imitating Scott. Like other American writers of his generation, he began his career with a, a kind of knockoff of British uh, domestic fiction. He had been recently reading aloud to his wife, who would suddenly lost her mother, um, to uh, uh, an onset of uh, a very serious disease. He had been reading aloud to her a British courtship tale in the mode of Jane Austen, but so far below Jane Austen's usual level that Cooper found it impossible to finish the book. He threw it down and pronounced it so bad that he, yes, he, could do better. Mrs. Cooper laughed, uh, challenged him to live up to the boast, uh, and he did. Uh, it was not a, a great book, but he did finish it. Uh, and actually, it, it did fairly well in England. It's the reversal of Susanna Rousen's story. It went through one edition in America, but five printings in Britain. Um, with that, Cooper was launched. Uh, his second novel was the one that really took up both Scott as a, 
uh, an English uh, model and uh, challenge, and the American past. This was The Spy, uh, the book that was remarkable not only for bringing the American Revolution at last into literary culture, uh, but also, uh, one forgets maybe, for initiating espionage as a subject for fiction. It's the first spy novel written by anybody. And it is about spying in the revolution. It's based, furthermore, on the career of an actual espionage agent in the Hudson Valley, of whom Cooper learned from John Jay. With the appearance of this book just before Christmas in 1821, we may date the founding of the American novel as a serious cultural institution engaged with exploring the people, places, and events of the country. It was an immediate sensation. The first printing sold out within a month, and two new ones quickly followed. Cooper, although he technically kept his name off the title page, as Scott did, was soon famous in New York and well beyond it. And as he fought his creditors in the courts, he suddenly had a new, very promising source of income. Uh, as I noted earlier, the spy uh, set in the Hudson Valley in the immediate aftermath of the treason of Benedict Arnold and the execution of Major John Andre of the British Army, it was biographically important to Cooper as well as historically important for the nation. Cooper was living in the midst of Westchester County at the time. And among his nearby neighbors was his wife's father, John Peter DeLancey, who came from loyalist stock and who had shared with young Susan's husband many of the tales that he had brought back from English exile on returning to his Native America in the early 1790s. John Peter DeLancey had not been just a sentimental loyalist. He had actively fought for the crown throughout the revolution. At Brandywine, in fact, he had been in the field against the one relative of the novelist, an uncle, James Cooper, for whom he was named, who had violated the Quaker peace testimony and fought openly in the revolution. Not surprisingly, Cooper portrayed the revolution as a result, not as a unitary uprising of American feeling against British oppression, but rather always as a civil war that tore apart late colonial society and dispersed families like the Delanceys across the old imperial map. From the outset, Cooper's own patriotism, um, marked, I think, or spurred by the fact that he had witnessed impressment of American sailors at sea from his own ship. At one point, he intervenes at the age of 17 between a, a British uh, lieutenant and an American sailor, whom, however, the British lieutenant takes off and forces into the British Navy. That was a key experience for Cooper in 1806 and 1807. It, it uh, formed his patriotism, and that patriotism carried forward not only into the naval history, but into the, the decision really to make fiction um, relevant to American experience and politically potent in the cultural war between the U.S. and Britain. Uh, yet, at the same time that he has this sort of patriotic uh, fervor and energy, uh, Cooper's awareness of his family's dissenting past, of the difficult experience of the Quakers during the Revolution, and his awareness of the sufferings of his wife's kin, as well as his familiarity with the difficult legacy of the Revolutionary War in Westchester, where it was really a bloody civil war, and elsewhere, made Cooper portray the, that war as a tough struggle for all, all parties, not as a patriotic pageant. Having opened the vein of the revolution, Cooper very quickly turned to the second great subject that came out of his biography, Frontier Settlement. In 1822, he wrote The Pioneers, based on his experience in one of his father's towns, Cooperstown in New York, uh, which his father had developed from 1790 uh, to his death in 1809. Um, and then, having written that story, which Cooper said he wrote to please himself, he turned very quickly to author a second and then a third Revolutionary War novel. The second, called The Pilot, was spurred in part by Walter Scott's attempt to write a sea story, uh, Cooper having been a sailor, uh, for many years, 
uh, both in the merchant marine and the navy and uh, the owner of a whale ship, etc., uh, decided that Scott needed to be shown up on this front. Um, so he uh, chose as the subject of his second Revolutionary War story John Paul Jones, the British expatriate whom the British called a pirate, um, who was the first uh, officer to fly the American flag on an American war vessel uh, in the Revolutionary War. Uh, there again, I think he's drawn to John Paul Jones because Jones represents the British difficulty with the war. He's also not uh, uh, fighting just out of a unified community. Jones was also, by this point, a kind of forgotten American hero. Cooper helped revive his memory. Uh, in the process, Cooper invented the sea novel, sort of offhandedly, as both uh, Herman Melville and Joseph Conrad testified, and he would write many sea novels over the coming decades. With that second Revolutionary War novel done, he decided to write a third. The 50th anniversary of the Revolution was approaching. Uh, Cooper was aware of the opportunity to maybe sell books, uh, bouncing off the mood of public celebration. He came to Boston um, to visit places like Old South um, and uh, the old uh, province house, uh, which was just down the street, uh, and uh, to see um, uh, Fannel Hall and uh, the North End, etc., but also to go out apparently to Lexington and Concord, we're not sure about that, uh, and certainly to Bunker Hill as uh, sort of site research. Uh, the uh, resulting book that he uh, published uh, uh, contains an astoundingly impressive account of Bunker Hill, based mostly actually on a British source. Uh, uh, he sets the observation point for the novel on Copses Hill in the North End, uh, which was where um, uh, several British officers uh, observed the battle from. Um, so Cooper used their narratives. But he read much other uh, material as well. Uh, having finished that book, which, however, flopped, Cooper felt at sixes and sevens. He had prefaced Lionel Lincoln with a promise to write what he called Legends of the Thirteen Colonies, 12 more novels, presumably one for each colony, uh, concerned with the revolution. Uh, and he was gearing up to do that when the first of them didn't succeed. Um, and he felt that lack of success quite directly since he was paying for the publication. And he didn't make anything on it unless it succeeded. So he abruptly changed direction. He had made a hint in The Pioneers in which he first introduced a character named Natty Bumpo, an old hunter in Cooperstown or Templeton, as it's called in the book. He'd made a hint toward the Seven Years' War. Uh, Natty, who's a garrulous old frontiersman, uh, in the book really to salt things up a bit among the dandies and judges and lawyers uh, and, and the uh, ordinary farmers, uh, makes a reference to the time he had served under Sir William jo Johnson at the defeat of Dieskau. Uh, that was an event that had taken place in September of 1755 on the shores of what Sir William Johnson had named just recently Lake George. The French had a different name for it. Uh, and uh, it was a minor event in the war, uh, but um, it, it seemed just right at the time as a way for indicating Natty's depth of historical memory and his involvement in the colonial past. I don't think at the time Cooper ever thought he'd write a book about Natty Bumpo, a second book about Natty Bumpo, let alone one set in the French and Indian War. However, when he was in Boston in uh, January of 1824, running around with a, a young Harvard student named Paul Trapier from South Carolina, who was the nephew of one of Cooper's old uh, Navy buddies who was stationed at the Boston Navy Yard, a man named Shubrick, uh, and running around with Shubrick himself and meeting Washington Alston, uh, having great dinners, drinking a lot of uh, wine, uh, and uh, nursing himself back from a serious illness, Cooper encountered other readings that start his, started him thinking about the deep colonial past, about how, especially once Lionel Lincoln failed, he might still write historical fiction, but uh, in a different subject area from the revolution, which he felt he had exhausted. One of the books that he uh, 
uh, acquired shortly after returning to New York in January of 1824. We know about it because his friend Schubert got him a copy and sent it to him on Cooper's orders. Uh, was a thing by a local lawyer named Samuel Sweat called An Historical and Topographical Sketch of Bunker, Bunker Hill Battle. It had been published in 1818 rather interesting from a number of perspectives. Cooper used it as a way of reimagining the lay of the land in 1775. He read it, and we know he used it as a kind of guidebook in, in writing Lionel Lincoln. But he also digested a second book that originally had been published uh, a, couple, a couple decades earlier that was bound together with Sweat's book in the copy that Schubert sent Cooper. And this was David Humphrey's essay on the life of the Honorable Major General Israel Putnam. Um, David Humphreys was one of the Connecticut wits, a uh, poet, uh, agricultural experimenter, particularly with merino sheep, which Cooper also had toyed with in his farms. Uh, and like Israel uh, uh, Putnam, Humphreys was a Connecticut Yankee. Uh, and he... Uh, put forward Putnam, who had been one of the major, one of the, the highest ranking American officers involved in Bunker Hill as an important figure in that battle, even though other people uh, disagreed with that view. And there was something of a pamphlet war going on, particularly when uh, just the years before Cooper visited Boston on that subject. Uh, but the most interesting thing that I think Cooper found in The Life of Putnam by David Humphreys wasn't the Revolutionary War material. It was Humphreys' account of Putnam's colonial service under William Johnson at Lake George in the, the, the Dieskau battle, and particularly Putnam's experience as a ranger, that is, as an informal kind of white Indian uh, fighter, in the battles of the woods of northern New York in the last French War. Some of the stories that were told about Putnam by Humphreys, for instance, included the one in which, in his native Connecticut, um, Putnam, uh, unafraid, like none of his neighbors, of an old wolf that lived in a famous cave in the town, went in after her, wrestled her single-handedly, and brought her out dead or during his service in the northern New York forest, a uh, story about how he rescued a whole company of soldiers, taking them down the rapids of the Hudson River in boats, or how he was captured uh, during the French and Indian War by Indians, uh, uh, tied to a stake, tortured, threatened with being burned alive before he managed to escape. All of these episodes in Putnam's historical pre-revolutionary experience were glommed onto by Cooper uh, and turned into episodes in this suddenly expanding biography he decided to write of Natty Bumpo and the border wars of New York. Uh, now, w when Cooper invented uh, Natty Bumpo, I think uh, Natty Bumpo comes into the first uh, chapter of the novel, and the first thing he does is wipe the snot off his nose on his sleeve. It's a very diagnostic action. It puts Natty in his place. At the end of the book, however, the old hunter has rescued the daughter of the local judge um, and uh, saved uh, a number of people from fire on the mountain. And he becomes a kind of heroic figure. So Cooper discovers something about this American character type, and then when he's thinking what to do after Lionel Lincoln fails, he decides, uh, based on his readings in Boston and back in New York, a trip he takes in the summer of 1824 to Lake George, Glens Falls, with some English uh, visitors, uh, and then uh, his own emerging interest in the Putnam story decides to make a move toward the French and Indian War. And then, it, just to sort of Think back to Michael Mann. What does Cooper do with that war once he decides to write about it in The Last of the Mohicans? Well, I think what's really interesting about Cooper's representation of the Seven Years' War is the way in which his complex view of the revolution as a civil war also tempered his understanding of the last struggle in which Americans and the English uh, fought side by side as allies. 
He never made the mistake of seeing the 1750s conflict as a trial run for the revolution. He went out of his way to portray the Americans in Last of the Mohicans, as I've suggested, as self-consciously British in outlook, values, and allegiance. Americans didn't call themselves Americans then. They called themselves Britons. Um, and, in, in fact, the, the term Americans as self-reference doesn't emerge until after the Stamp Act in newspapers, for instance. Duncan Hayward, as Cooper created him, was thus an American native, not an Englishman. His wearing of the British uniform was intended to mark the manner in which American families, like the Delanceys, for instance, had invested their emotions and energies, one might say lives, fortunes, and sacred honors, in the monarchy. But it is not only Hayward who indicates this theme. It's a really interesting point about Natty Bumpo. Natty Bumpo in this book, and then the three others that Cooper eventually wrote about other points in his career, uh, in the so-called Leatherstocking Tales, is presented as a staunch follower of a family by the name of Effingham, who proved to be loyalists in 1776 in Cooper's mythic or fictional history, and who were clearly based in general terms on the Delanceys, his in-laws. When, late in his life, Cooper contemplated writing yet a sixth Leatherstocking tale, this one set in the whole, in the whole fictional history, the revolution, because they run from um, the 1740s up to uh, 1856, but there's a big hole, and it's the period of the revolution. Cooper decided to fill that hole, but he never wrote the book probably because he must have realized that Natty Bumpo's old colonial politics simply would not easily allow such a story. Um, doing such a story, writing such a story, would have forced together too neatly the two wars that Cooper had tried so hard to keep apart. His revolution was never a Fourth of July celebration, shadowed as it was by the messiness of the actual war as Cooper came to understand it. But having Natty Bumpo move from the old frame of reference to the new must have seemed simply too neat a, revol a resolution. Cooper left that task, I think, for the likes of Michael Mann and that defiant, half-naked Englishman, Daniel Day-Lewis, son of the poet laureate, whom Mann cast as Natty Bumpo in his own little work of revolutionary war fiction in 1992. Thank you.